Okay, so let us continue with the uh, discussion that we have been having on estimators. Until the last class we talked about Fisher's information, the bias and variance and so on. Um, <coughs> if you consider any estimation method, the, the, there are these important properties that we have talked about bias, variance, efficiency, consistency and so on. We have given formal definitions for bias and variance. <coughs> While bias is concerned with the accuracy of the estimator, variance is uh, concerned with the precision that is how much the estimate is going to vary across experiments. And one of the things that we should remember is as much as bias, unbiasedness is desirable, it is okay to have a biased estimator, but what is more serious is the precision. If the uh, uh, if there are two estimators, one being a biased one and having a lower precision, I am sorry, lower uh, variability that is higher precision and another estimator which is unbiased but having a larger accuracy, a uh, larger uh, variability, then one would prefer perhaps the more precise estimator at the cost of bias. The, that does not mean that always one has to sacrifice bias for getting lower precision but if it has to be sacrificed, then it is okay. So, as a simple example, suppose you take the uh, estimator of variance, we know that there are two different forms of estimator, we had discussed this. The estimator of uh, variance is given by unbiased estimator has a 1 over n minus 1 uh, Vk minus V bar square the sum of that whereas the biased one which is given out by MLE has this expression to it. Of these two <coughs> this is the unbiased one whereas obviously if this is unbiased uh, estimator of the variance then this is a biased one. What we mean by unbiased is the expected value of sigma square hat n minus 1 is sigma square, sigma square v itself. Whereas, here the expected value of sigma square hat n is going to be n minus 1 by n sigma square v, which means obviously there is a bias in the uh, second estimator which is given out by the MLE. Now, what is happening here is uh, we have lost some accuracy as we move from this estimator to this estimator. However, you can show that the second estimator uh, is uh, has lower variability than the first one okay. and <clears throat> this fundamental principle should be remembered always in estimation theory whether you are estimating parameters of a PDF or parameters of a model in any estimation exercise there is always a compromise between bias and variance always and we will keep talking about that. In fact, if you recall we talked about AIC Akaika information criterion a while ago when we were uh, uh, when we were going through a case study on building ARMA models from data. There we talked about AIC and AIC measures the trade off between bias and variance, but the bias that we are talking about in AIC is the bias in your prediction and variance that we are talking about in AIC is variability in the parameter estimates. So, when you have a model very simple model let us say a first order AR or something very simple model does not have to be in the context of random uh, processes any for any process if you build a simple model it is likely that the simple model may do a poor job of prediction, but has very few parameters maybe one or two parameters. And then in a bit to improve the prediction we start increasing the complexity of the model. So, we may for example, move from AR 1 to AR 4 which has more parameters to estimate clearly more the parameters that you have in the model better is your ability to predict because you have more. Uh, parameter power you can say more manpower to do the job for you. But then remember the information content 
in the data is fixed, you are using the same data, you are not going to use any other data set. And this has to be the information content in the data is like the food and that has to be distributed among the parameters. When you have more parameters in the model, I am giving you qualitative uh, arguments here. Later on when we move to least squares, you will see quantitative expressions as well. When you have more parameters in the model, you will uh, see that the variability in the parameter estimates is going to shoot up. But what have you achieved? You have actually reduced the bias in the prediction. You have gotten the predictions of the model closer to the observed values. So that is the standard trade off that you would have and now you can extend this argument further as I have more and more complicated models, lower is going to be the bias in the prediction but higher is going to be the variability in parameter estimates. So in any estimation exercise there is going to be a trade off between bias and variance. So in this example normally one prefers to work with this for large samples. When you have large observations you say I will just use this. When you have small observations maybe you want to work with this. Another example that we will come across very soon is the estimator of autocovariance function. You have used that the sample autocovariance function has a factor of 1 over n if you recall right. So let me write that expression for you if you have forgotten. Sigma hat of L is 1 over n sigma v k minus v bar times v k minus L minus v bar right and <coughs> here k runs from L to uh, n minus 1. You can say mod L if you are looking at positive. So in this case obviously you have n minus L terms at any lag L there are n minus L terms in the summation and intuitively if you want an unbiased estimate of the autocovariance function you should have had a 1 over n minus mod L as the factor here so that you get an unbiased estimate of the autocovariance function. But we still work with 1 over n. Very well knowing that this 1 over n is going to give me a biased estimate of the autocovariance function. Why do we do that? One of the reasons being that it has lower variance than the unbiased one. There is another reason that we will learn later on. But one of the reasons is that the variance is lower. This does not mean as I said earlier that if you have to get more uh, precise estimates, you have to sacrifice the bias. It does not mean that. But if you have to do it, then it is okay. That is what it means. Now let us talk about again come back to the world of unbiased estimators. What I have essentially tried to uh, convey is precision is a far more serious property than accuracy, desirable property than accuracy. There is nothing like having both accurate and precise estimator and that is what we are seeking here minimum variance unbiased estimator. But the it can happen that for a process you may not be able to find a minimum variance unbiased estimator which means you may not be able to find an accurate both an accurate and a precise estimator. Then you may have to sacrifice one of the things and typically we would like to sacrifice accuracy for precision that is the message. Okay. So what is the difference, uh, definition of a MVUE or minimum variance unbiased estimator? Well it is straightforward first of all it should be unbiased and among this world of uh, class of unbiased estimators it will have the least variability right. So we are being fair we are not comparing this estimator with a biased one. If I start comparing the variance of an unbiased estimator with a biased one then the biased one will beat it and there is no limit. I can always sacrifice the bias highly to get more precise estimates. Okay. So it is not fair to compare the variance of an unbiased estimator with that of a biased one. Therefore we restrict ourselves to the class of biased uh, estimators. Now the notion of efficiency has uh, actually stems from this concept of minimum variance estimators. These are all extremely fundamental concepts to estimation theory. There is no escape to this. Efficiency is very straightforward. We have talked about this earlier. Efficiency is the ratio of the variability of the best estimator that is the minimum variance estimator to the variance of that estimator under study. 
okay. So, the theta hat star is the minimum variance unbiased estimator. It goes without saying I do not have to keep saying unbiased. When I say minimum variance unless otherwise stated you should assume it is unbiased also. So, theta hat star is the minimum variance uh, estimator whereas, theta hat is the estimator under study, okay. So, the efficiency is the ratio of the variability of theta hat star to the variance of theta hat. Because theta hat star is a minimum variance estimator, what does it mean? The variance of theta hat star, the numerator is always going to be less than maximum or to the equal to the denominator. If theta hat is the minimum variance itself, then they are going to be equal. So, the maximum efficiency that an estimator can achieve is 100 percent, okay. And this is called efficiency for reasons I had explained earlier. What you are pumping into the estimator is data, fine, that is what you are feeding in, out comes the estimate. But behind the scenes, what you are feeding in is the uncertainty in the data, and out comes the uncertainty in the estimate. So, efficiency of an estimator is a measure of uh, the ability of the estimator to reduce or shrink that uncertainty to produce a more certain number. That that is how you can interpret efficiency has. Yes. And there is also relative efficiency. Suppose I have two estimators, two methods of estimating, then which is more efficient? Then you just divide the ratio of the variances accordingly. Now, this is a schematic which kind of gives you an idea of what is bias, what is variance and efficiency. So, if you look at the left hand side plot here, what I have here is uh, just some estimates indicated by this crosshair marks and then there is a uh, and that is indicated by theta hat of i corresponding to the ith realization of data that you have. Theta naught is a true value and then you have mu theta hat which is average, right. It is the average of the uh, estimates that you have across all the realizations. Bias is a distance between the average of the estimates and the truth. If the estimate is unbiased, they will coincide. Now, on the right hand side, you have two different estimators theta 1 hat and theta 2 hat and I am just showing you the PDF of it. That is the distribution of the estimates obtained from these two different estimators across the uh, realization space. And both are unbiased. As you can see, they both are centered around theta naught. But the one in red has lower variability, lower spread than the one in blue which has a larger spread. So, we say theta 1 hat is more efficient than theta 2 hat, okay. So, uh, the other way of in, uh, imagining this or interpreting this is that theta 1 hat produces estimates that have a higher probability of being closer uh, to theta naught then theta 2 does. That is another way of looking at it. But you can say essentially theta 1 hat is more precise than theta 2 hat. So, hopefully this schematic kind of gives you a better picture of this uh, terminology. Obviously, now the hunt is for the most efficient estimator. I would like the most precise estimator and of course, an unbiased one. And this was the question that was asked long ago by statisticians and the answer came out in the form of the celebrated kramer rao inequality which as i'll show you is very closely related depend related to fisher's information the bound itself is is the uh, inverse of the fisher's information so what we want to ask is for a given estimation problem what is the minimum variance that i should expect to see that is question number 1 and the second question, question number 2 is what is that estimator which will give me that minimum variance. Now, as I said earlier, you may be able to find a bound on the minimum variance, but you may not be able to necessarily find, devise an estimator that will get you that bound. In that case, the minimum variance only remains an imagination, an ideal one that you cannot realize physically, right. So, there are many such idealities in, in many different fields. So, that MVUA also will become that uh, you know that imagination uh, some uh, something that you wanted to achieve in life and it will remain an, as an imagination because you could never realize the dream. 
it is also possible that in estimation you will have the same uh, story. So, what is the Kramer Ross inequality? It essentially says if there is an unbiased estimator and uh, of some single parameter, right now we will just focus on a scalar case. I suppose I have an unbiased estimator of a single parameter theta and if the PDF is regular, so there is a condition PDF of what of the data is regular, then the variance of any unbiased estimator is bounded below by the inverse of the Fisher information, which means the minimum variance that is achievable for any estimator is the inverse of the Fisher's information, which now helps us appreciate Fisher's information lot more. Uh, what this result says is as the information content in the data about this parameter theta grows, the minimum va the variance that you can achieve goes down, which is good. That means you, you, are, you can dream of getting more and more precise uh, estimates, which is good. So, this quantifies <coughs> the expectations that people may have on uh, how precise an estimator I can construct for a theta. That is the first part of the Kramer Rouse inequality. The second part talks about its existence, whether an estimator exists that will achieve the lower bound. And it exists only if you can express uh, this uh, relation that is given in uh, equation 27 here, which relates the score, which is nothing but the derivative of the likelihood to the Fisher's information and the, your theta star minus theta. So, uh, what is theta here? The parameter that you are estimating. Theta hat star is the efficient estimator that you are searching and Fisher's information we already know, the score we already know. In other words, what it says is if I am given the data and the likelihood and so on, then <coughs> essentially the uh, what you have from this relation. So, let us write for theta hat star. Essentially, I of theta inverse times the score plus your theta should be independent of y. Should be independent of theta. Okay. In fact, it is a scalar, so I am going to remove that. Sorry about that. So, <coughs> What it says is that um, if you were to rewrite this expression in a different way, which is what I have done, then the right hand side should get me theta hat star, which is purely a function of y. I should not need anything else to construct the efficient estimator. It can turn out that in many cases that this expression can in turn be a function of the true parameter, in which case you cannot use it. This is nothing but according to the Kramer Rouse inequality, this is nothing but your theta hat star. What does it say? Theta hat star is only a function of the observations of and of nothing else. So, let us go through an example and we will uh, we'll appreciate it much better. <coughs> so, uh, let me actually uh, go through this example here where we are again returning to the standard problem of estimating mean. Earlier, we, we use this example to illustrate the concept of estimation, how the objective function can change the nature of the estimate. Then we use this example to compute Fisher's information. Now, we are using the same example to illustrate the Kramer Rouse inequality. So, in this example, what we want to know is given n observations of a white noise Gaussian white noise process, what is the most efficient estimator of mean? That is it. We are not asking for linear estimators, non-linear, we are not imposing any form. The only requirement that we are asking is of course, unbiased as well, it is understood because Kramer Rouse inequality focuses on unbiased estimators. We are, we are asking what is the most efficient estimator of mean? Right? Now, we can easily work this out for n observations, what was the Fisher's information that we had for mean? What was I of mu? So, 
sorry n by sigma square very good n by sigma square and what is the score function that we had the derivative of the log likelihood you recall sorry just 1 by sigma square no way. So, for the Gaussian white noise process <coughs> hmm, summation sorry ok very good uh, y k minus mu divided by sigma square good correct. Now, can you put together these two pieces of information and of course, theta of interest is mu. So, put all of this into this expression and get me theta hat star and, and tell me then if it is independent of the parameter that you are estimating. What do you get? Good. Let us see if there is any other person who is able to see that. A very simple algebra, is nothing much to do. Does anybody else get the sample mean? Right. Yeah, so you should get the sample mean as the answer. And is it independent of the parameter that I am estimating? Yes which means I have hit the jackpot. First of all, what I know from Fisher's information is this is the, le the inverse of this is the least variance that I should expect for estimating mean among all unbiased estimators. It does not matter whom you ask what is it as, as long as it is unbiased, no estimator can achieve a lower bound than this right which is inverse of i which is sigma square by n and we have already proved that the variance of sample mean is sigma square by n. From that result itself we should have guessed that sample mean achieves this bound ok. Now, we have also shown that indeed that that efficient estimator is a sample mean. Look at how beautiful the kramer rouse inequality is. We did not have to solve any optimization problem nothing we just asked for the most efficient estimator and it came out and said use the sample mean which is what we use daily. But of course, it tells you a lot of things it says sample mean is unbiased of course, is the most efficient estimator only at least when from this result we know that this is true only for Gaussian white noise processes. You should ask yourself if you were to change the PDF instead of Gaussian white noise suppose the PDF suppose the distribution was Laplacian or Poisson some, some other distribution chi square would you expect to see sample mean coming out as the most efficient estimator would you expect to see the inverse of this as the bound. Intuitively no right you would see something else <coughs> but that is the beauty this entire result not only tells you what is the most efficient estimator, but also tells you that sample mean which is something that we use routinely is most efficient only for uh, at least from this example for Gaussian white noise uh, process. So, that is the beauty of this kramer rouse inequality. Now, the other thing that of course, we see is that uh, it is uh, the linear it is a linear estimator which is also good news ok. So, that is it. So, we have uh, I am just going to go past this which we have discussed. Now, let us just briefly talk about the existence of an efficient estimator. What does it depend on? Of course, it depends on the parameter that you are estimating. Uh, the first factor that is going to affect the existence of an efficient estimator is the parameter to be more precise how the parameter enters the model. Where your parameter is sitting in the model is it hiding somewhere behind a corner or is it making itself fairly uh, obvious so that you can estimate it very well you can think of it this way. And 
uh, that is the example that I have given and in parametric modeling this has got to do with how you parameterize your model all right uh, whether you are actually parameterizing in such a way that you get an auto regressive model or a moving average model or some other model and so on that will determine your ability to find an, uh, the most efficient uh, estimator. The second factor of course as you can see and we have discussed that is going to affect is the PDF itself whether the PDF is regular or not in the statement itself it says if the PDF is regular or not. Uh, if the PDF is not regular then the Kramer-Ross inequality itself does not apply okay. So that kind of uh, you know uh, concludes our discussion on Kramer-Ross inequality and Kramer-Ross bound but uh, it has far far reaching implications. The Kramer-Ross Kramer bound is used as a gold standard for determining the most efficient estimator and tomorrow if you come up with an, with an estimation method you will also have to show for that parameter that you are estimating. Any problem that you take your method uh, may give you some variance it cannot give you if it is unbiased it cannot give in its variance lower than what the Kramer-Ross inequality has uh, is telling you. So that is a test that you have to do to uh, show the, whether you have achieved that efficiency or you are uh, how far you are away from that efficiency. Any questions on this before we move on to mean square error? 